Well, good morning. Welcome to Walden Community Church. Let me ask you a question this morning. Who do you think is more trusting? People under 30 or people over 30? A question was asked. Do you have confidence that American people will do what they can to help those in need? 80% of those 65 and older said yes. But only 53% of those in their 30s said yes. Do you have confidence that American people will work together to solve community problems? 71% of those 65 and older said yes, compared to only 52% of younger. Do you have confidence that American people will treat one another with respect? 74% of older people said yes, compared to only 48% of younger people. Do you have confidence that American people will accept election results no matter who wins? 66% of those 65 and older said yes, compared to only 44% of younger. Why does it seem like younger people are more mistrusting? Or maybe the other question is, why do we become more trusting as we get older? Maybe it's because growing up, you were told that trick-or-treating wasn't safe, or it wasn't safe to wait by the bus stop by yourself. It wasn't safe to walk to school without an adult. As kids, as you were growing up, Adults and parents make all these rules that create a declining level of trust. It used to be that kids could walk blocks away to play with their friends. And now it's too dangerous for kids to go anywhere without a bodyguard. Hold my hand in the parking lot and stay next to me in the store because otherwise somebody might snatch you. Let's face it, those rules don't really make kids safer, but it does make them distrust the world. Isn't it funny how being trusting can be a nice characteristic? It's a good character trait, but if you're too trusting, then it means you're gullible. It means you're naive. But we need to be trusting people, and we probably even need to be more trusting than we already are. Otherwise, we will never try anything new. We will never take a risk. We will never fall in love. Ernest Hemingway said the best way to find out if you can trust somebody is to trust them. Because without trust, the world is a rotten place, filled with rotten people who are only looking out for themselves. Last week, we talked about the Bible and I offered some ideas about how to read it, how to study it, but what if you don't even trust it? How can stories of parted seas and blind people seeing and lepers being cleansed and the lame walking, the dead being raised to life, how can any of that be true? I said last week, the Bible is a story. It's God's story about how he created us, how he died for us, but why read it if I can't trust it? From the mid-1970s all the way through 1984, close to 40% of Americans considered the Bible to be the literal word of God. But this has been declining. As of a few years ago, the most recent poll said that 26% of Americans view the Bible as a book of fables, legends, history, and moral precepts that were recorded by people. The Bible is one of the most widely read books in all of history. It's one of the best-selling books in history. In, in a single year, it can sell as many as 40 million copies. And it is one of the most widely translated books in history. Roughly 90% of the world can read the Bible. But what makes it the Word of God? And how do we know it's the Word of God? Psalm 19 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. 
The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. The author, David, here says that he loves the word of God. Plus, in several of his writings, he talks about how much care he has for it, how much devotion he has for it. Notice here in Psalm, he uses words like perfect, reviving, sure, wise, right, pure, enlightening, enduring, and righteous. He certainly thinks these are the words of God, right? And I, I certainly wouldn't use any of those words to describe something that a person wrote. Psalm 119 tells us, all of your commands can be trusted. So here the author says that everything in the Bible can be trusted. It can be true because it's from God. And it's one thing for the Bible to claim that it is the word of God. It's one thing for the Bible to say it can be trusted. But how do I really know? How do I know this is the word of God? Couldn't it also be lies? Couldn't it also be fables and fairy tales? What is in here that can reveal to me that this book is more than just the writing of people? And that's a valid, legitimate, important question that we need to ask before we can ever start studying the Bible. How do I know that I can trust it? So today I want to ask that question. Can I trust the Bible? <clears throat> Time Magazine thought it was such an important question, they put it on their cover two times. Here's one cover of Time Magazine that says how true is the Bible, and another cover of Time Magazine, is the Bible fact or fiction? So these aren't just questions that agnostics have, right? These aren't just questions that atheists have. The world asks these questions. The History Channel is always running a special or some show about the Bible. So I, I hope that means at least that the History Channel agrees that the Bible is history. Second Timothy says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That phrase there, breathed out by God, that is the uh, word in the Greek, theonustos. It's just one word, breathed out, theonustos. Theo means God, and pneuma means breath, or it means spirit. That means the Bible has been exhaled by God, right? Literally breathed out of God's mouth. It is his voice. It is his word. Now, think back to the very beginning of the Bible, those first pages of Genesis. Genesis 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the spirit of God, the pneuma of God, was hovering over the face of the water. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. So here we see the Spirit of God doing what? Speaking, breathing out. And what happens when the Spirit speaks? Creation. Things are created. And so Paul is writing to Timothy, right here in 2 Timothy 3, and he's saying, hey, just like how the world was created by the breath of God, so the word of God, the Bible, was also created. But you and I both know that the Bible didn't just appear one day as a completed book, right? It didn't just fall in our laps, already finished. God didn't breathe out the, uh, the book in the same way that he spoke the world into place. So where did the Bible come from? Because I think in order to trust something, Maybe first, we need to know something about it. That's why we ask these questions. You, you do research before you make a purchase, same thing. Well, I can't possibly teach you everything about Bible history and just the time that we have, but just let's see how much we can throw out there, okay? The word, the word Bible comes from the Latin word biblia and the Greek word biblos, 
both of those mean book. The word probably comes from the city of Byblos, which is in Lebanon. It was the Egyptian city that the Greeks first acquired their paper from. The Bible, as we have it today, is split up into two portions, the Hebrew, Old Testament, and the Greek, New Testament. The word testament means covenant, or it means agreement. The Old Testament tells the story of the covenant between God and the Hebrew people up to about 400 BC. The Old Testament was already being assembled and being put together by Jewish scribes as early as 250 BC. The Jewish Old Testament is known as the Tanakh. The word Tanakh is a Hebrew acronym for all the various parts that make up the book. So it's an acronym for law, prophet, and writing. The New Testament tells the story of God's Son, and it contains 21 letters written to pastors, missionaries, and the early churches that met in homes. So that leads us to another really good question. How reliable were the authors? Well, the Bible was primarily written by eyewitness accounts. Moses, right, was there when the Red Sea parted, and he wrote it down. Joshua was there when the walls of Jericho fell, and he wrote it down. The disciples of Jesus sat in the upper room, later saw the resurrected Christ appear, and they wrote it down. Listen to John. He says, he who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. What, is, what does John say? I was there, <laughs> and I wrote it down, right? Later, another guy named Luke interviewed everybody he could find, including Jesus' own mother, and then he wrote it down. Luke 1 begins, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you. Luke says, I followed every eyewitness closely and I wrote you an orderly account. Listen to what Peter says. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Peter says, we did not make this up. We actually saw these things. But maybe another thing you've heard from people is that, well, maybe the Bible was right when it was first written down, but it, you know, it's passed it's been passed down from generation to gener generation. And you know, since that time, human error has crept in. People have changed the words, they've changed the meaning over time. You ever heard that? Like maybe a word was left out or a word was added? What if someone just put in their own idea? What if the quote was misheard? or misread? What if there was some sort of secret agenda that was later put in that promoted racism or inequality? Listen to Deuteronomy 6. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. From those earliest of days, there were people who were in charge of writing down God's word and keeping that word the same year after year and they, they were called the scribes which brings another question well how reliable were the scribes well here's what we know the scribes were an order they had to follow a certain set of rules of which there were hundreds and they wrote down and copied the religious texts when the scribes first began copying down Jewish scripture, uh, they were copied by hand, of course, because 
Xerox is not a Hebrew word. And they couldn't have done it their own way. They couldn't have just made up their own rules for it. There had to be consistency. So strict detail had to be followed. So just here's a couple of the rules. Before his time of writing, the scribe would have to purify himself with water. And then his scroll had to be written on the cleanest animal parchment. Each skin had to contain a specific amount of columns that were equal through the entire book. Every single column couldn't be less than 48 or more than 60 lines in length. The column width had to be exactly 30 letters. The space, the size of a thread, was to appear between each consonant. A space of three lines had to appear between each book, and no word could be copied from memory. It had to be copied letter by letter. And if they were writing out the name of God, they would stop and pray, both to focus and also to pray against any distraction, lest they were distracted while they were writing the name of God. And they would first re-dip their ink before they would begin to write so that there was no smudges and the ink wouldn't dry out halfway through the name of God. And once finished, the scribe had to count the number of times each letter of the alphabet occurred in each book and then compare it to the original. And once a manuscript was copied down, it was given the same weight and value as the original. They were so exact that they actually knew the middle letter of each book in the Old Testament. And so after they copied all of this, they would go and find that middle letter and count forward and then count backward. And if it didn't come out to the exact number it should, they would burn it and start over. That's how exact they were. If a manuscript was ever found to have one mistake, or if it ever got wet so the ink might run, it was burned. Now listen, if your boss made you that meticulous about data entry, or graphic design, or that he was that picky about errors, how often would you make a mistake? How careful would you be? How many of you would have quit on the very first day and, and said, you know, I, I, I'm going to go be a farmer. <laughs> so when Psalm 119 tells us all your commands can be trusted, we at least know that the people who first wrote it down, saw it, heard it, they believed it to be God's word. And the people who copied it were beyond meticulous to preserve God's message. Well, then what happened? How did all those random books of, and, and random letters start coming together? How do we end up with this book now that we call the Bible? Well, that process is called canonization. And to be honest, that's really a, a whole other lesson all to itself. But the short version is, if they placed a book into the Bible and they said, this is canon, it had to pass five very strict criteria. The first of which is, is it authoritative, right? Does it, does it have authority? Second, is it prophetic? In other words, does it speak the true words of God? Three, is it authentic? Meaning, do we know who wrote it? Or were they an eyewitness? Four, is it dynamic? Do these words change lives? Is there a reason to read it? Five, was it back then received, collected, read, and used by the church? In other words, was this a book that many people have kept and copied and preserved through history? In 132 BC, the Hebrew Old Testament was translated into Greek by Jewish scholars in Alexandria, Egypt. That translation became known as the Septuagint, which means 70, because it took 70 people to translate it. Much later in 397 AD, the New Testament was canonized. In the fourth century, we got a translation known as the Latin Vulgate. Obviously, this is the Latin translation 
of Scripture, and for the next 1,000 years, <laughs> it would be the only definitive edition, and it was the most influential text of all of Western Europe today. Then, in 1494, a man named William Tyndale steps into the scene, and when he was a chaplain in Wales, he commented to a priest, if God spare my life, ere many days, I will cause a boy that driveth the plow shall know more of the scripture than thou. That's a pretty bold statement. In 1975, Bill Gates had a dream that he would put a computer in everyone's home. But 400 years before the computer, William Tyndale's dream was to place a readable Bible in the hands of the boy that mows your lawn. In 1524, Tyndale moved to Germany, met Martin Luther, translated the Bible into English, and because of the printing press, he was able to print 6,000 Bibles his first run. And when I think that I have 20 Bibles or so in my office, and then maybe another five or six in my house, all of those Bibles owe something to the work of people like Martin Luther and William Tyndale. Later, in 1947, a young shepherd boy was throwing rocks into the desert hills of Qumran in Israel. His rocks were heard breaking clay pots where he discovered a series of caves that contained clay pots and inside them, we would later say, they were the Dead Sea Scrolls, wherein archaeologists and Bible scholars found 972 texts of Scripture. Why is that significant? Well, because before 1947, the oldest biblical manuscript we had dated from 900 AD. After the 1947 Dead Sea Scroll discovery, the oldest biblical manuscript we had was from 125 B.C. So for your friend who insists that the Bible has changed or been altered over time or has been rewritten with an agenda from language to language or from translation to translation, once the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered and then compared to the ones that we had been using this entire time for biblical translation, we found them to be 95% identical. Now, I'm not going to lie to you and say they were 100% identical, but the 5% variance was only in spelling and in uh, style, punctuation, the way the words were grouped together. It had no way uh, changed the meaning of the words. That means that over the thousands of years that the Bible has been spoken and carried and translated and written, it has always remained perfectly the same. What does that mean? It means the Bible can be trusted. The Bible has 25,000 manuscripts all over the world. The earliest are fragments from the Gospel of John, and they were written within 50 years of his death. That means using the accepted standard for evaluating the reliability of ancient manuscripts, the Bible stands alone. It has no other equal. But see, all that does is tell you the Bible is reliable. It allows you to trust the authors and the scribes and perhaps even the copying process. And I could go on and on and on about the history of Scripture, talk about how it speaks about real places and real events and real people. I could talk about the Bible and how it's related in the scientific community. I could talk about the Bible as, uh, it, as it's come under attack and how it's come out on top and triumphs or, or how men and women have died to defend it. I could talk about how it's predicted true events or how even Jesus himself quoted it. And all those conversations could be useful. They might even convince you. But in the end, they're all human arguments. And a human argument uses human logic. And that's not fitting for a book like this. 
because there is no other book like this. So can we believe that this is actually God's word? I mean, sure, the authors and the scribes believed, but how can I believe? It's one thing to affirm the Bible claims to be God's word. It's another thing to be convinced that it is. The Bible is its own authority. The Bible is self-attesting. I mean, think about it. If I were to prove the Bible is God's word by using science, then science is the authority. Science is the standard. If I used history to prove the Bible, then history would be the authority. So the Bible has to be its own authority. So it can only be proved by the Bible. If anything else could prove the Bible was legitimate, then it would be the authority and not Scripture. Second Peter says, We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter says, nothing in this book came from a human author. And so, if it's all God's word, then it has to be the authority. Even Jesus trusted the Bible. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, you know, I like the things that Jesus said. I trust him. I'm just not sure about all those other guys. Yes, but Jesus trusted the other guys. <laughs> Matthew 5, 18, Jesus says, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until it is all accomplished. In John 10, Jesus says, Scripture cannot be broken. Jesus proclaimed the truth of the Bible. Jesus looks at the Bible and he says, these words are going to last until the end of time. It's all going to accomplish all that God wants to accomplish. When you read how Jesus talks about the Bible with people, he would often base his argument on a biblical truth. He would take out a sentence or even a single word from the Bible. So if Jesus believes every single sentence, if he believes every single word, if he believes it has weight and it has authority, then so should I. Luke 11, Jesus says, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. In other words, read it, <laughs> trust it, do what it says, right? Don't read it like poetry or counseling, or self-help, or mysticism. Read it and obey it like it could actually change your life because God gave it to you so that it would change your life. But that's a circular argument, isn't it? Isn't that a circular argument? I believe scripture to be God's word because it says it's God's word. Sounds to me like a circular ar argument. That, that, that's the logic I use with my kid, right? You know, when my kid says, why do I have to do that? I say, because I said so, <laughs> right? I never understood that reasoning until now. Back then, when I was a kid, it didn't make any sense. And you know what? It is. It is a circular argument. You're right. It doesn't make any sense. But so what? <laughs> Just because it's a circular argument doesn't mean that it's not true. But let's, let's use logic, all right? If the Bible is God's word, and thus the ultimate authority, then only the ultimate authority can be measured against which it's measured. In my Bible it says, Thus says the Lord, 414 times. And so if the Bible contains the word of God, and if Jesus believed it, and the authors believed it, and the scribes believed it, 
then I have to believe it. We started by saying that God spoke the world into existence in Genesis. But what more will he do when he speaks to us through his word? You see, I have to believe the Bible has power because God has power. I have to believe the Bible changes lives because God changes lives. Jesus said it like this in John 8, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This says that knowing the truth and being free will change your life. And what's crazy is major colleges, major universities all around the world, they will put the second half of this verse printed in stone on their buildings, on on their law buildings. The, The truth will set you free. And while that is true, it's also ignoring the Bible because they forgot the first part. If you abide in my word, you will know the truth. Jesus says, if you stay close to these words, if you know these words, then you will know the truth. Do you want to know why? Because God doesn't lie. Hebrews 6, it is impossible for God to lie. People always ask, you know, their pastor, is there anything that God can't do? Yeah, God can't lie. Do you believe everything that comes to you in your emails? No? Do you believe everything that you watch on TV? No. Do you believe everything you read in the newspaper or the tabloids or Facebook or YouTube? No. So why do we spend more time reading and watching stuff on YouTube, the internet, TV, that we know is a lie than we do reading what we know is the truth? You want proof? Then you have to read it. 1 Corinthians 2 says, We have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit. The natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them. Listen, you'll never be sitting next to a Bible (laughs) and have the Holy Spirit whisper in your ear, hey, you see that book over there? That's God's word. That's not how it works. Second, if you came here today and you were hoping that I could convince you or, or preach some sort of convicting argument for the Bible, I can't do that either. You have to read it for yourself. Paul says if you need convincing, you need to read it so that you are taught not by people, but by the Spirit. Otherwise, the idea of a book containing God's Word is going to sound like foolishness to you. Jesus says in John 10, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Jesus says, when you hear my voice, you will recognize me. But in order for me to hear God's words, I have to read them. So the fundamental question, the most important question you're going to ask yourself in life is, what is going to be the ultimate authority in my life? What's going to be the ultimate authority for me? You need to decide that. Is it going to be the word or is it going to be the world? Am I going to listen to what God says is true or am I going to listen to something else? What's going to be the authority in my life? But listen, if the Bible doesn't open during the week, it's not because I can't do it. It's because I won't do it. And maybe it doesn't have anything to do with whether I have time to read it, but more because I know that if I read it, that it has to be the authority in my life. If I read it, I have to do what it says. 
As long as I don't read it, I can say the boss and I can do whatever I want. Jesus says in John 8, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus says, if you abide in my word, right? That's the first part. That's the first thing he says. Abide is the Greek word meno. Meno is a word that consists in both space and time. Meno means stay here. Listen, if you want to live and have real truth, abandon all the false voices that rile you up, and quite frankly, they don't make your life any better, and stay here. Jesus says, those who stay here are truly my disciples. Those who stay here know the truth. Those who stay here are free. Join me in prayer. Father God, we are so appreciative of this book, so privileged to have these words, so grateful to own not just a copy of history, not just pages that were meticulously copied and died for and preserved and prepared and assembled just for me, but more so that I get to open these words and hear your voice, that I have the privilege to sit at your footsteps and to listen to you, to speak truth and word and promises and law and grace to me whenever I want. Lord, give me a hunger and a thirst for these words. Let them be as food that I would miss them when they are gone from me. When they are absent, I would feel the void in my heart. Lord, I don't need truth from anywhere else. And the world lies to me by telling me that truth exists somewhere else. That the news I should be listening to is from somewhere else. When everything I need is in this book, when everything I need comes from you. Lord, may I learn to tune out the world more and tune into your word more. May this word be more important to me than ever before. When I see a world that is being split in half, my desire isn't that they would be more like me, that they would know my truth, that they would think like me. Rather, my desire is that they would be more like you, that they would listen to your son, that they would listen to these words, that they would hear and obey. Lord, send revival. Send revival to your church. As churches and businesses and as our company begins to reopen, Lord, send revival. Send your Holy Spirit out into communities and wake people up. Re help them to remember that it's been a bumpy road and the only way to return is to get back to the things that they learned in Sunday school. But Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so. Little ones, to him belong. They are weak, and he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Let Jesus' love be the thing that I seek out more than anything else. May it be my desire to be loved by him more, to know that love, and then to turn that love around and love the world. Only you and your grace and your cross can restore what is broken. Send your church out. Send revival. Send your Holy Spirit out into the world. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for this book. Thank you for your church. Thank you for my Christian brothers and sisters who are here on my left and on my right, who are listening at home. Thank you for them. Stir in them 
that desire this year to get back to the only truth, the only source of authority, your word. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching. And just as a reminder, if you know your Bible at home doesn't do it for you, if it's old, it's torn up, missing pages, or if it's just some translation that you aren't excited about, please go out and get another one. Get one that speaks to you. Get one that you love to read. Get one that you are excited to read. Get one that excites you. Don't worry about translation. Don't worry about what other people say. You need to get into this book. However that needs to take place, go to the bookstore, go to Amazon, read some reviews, find a Bible that you're going to love, find a Bible that you're going to read. I love you guys. See you next time. Bye.